it's amazing. And uh, everybody keeps saying that you people are the future and children are the future and all that stuff. But but the thing is that uh, uh, you guys really are actually, and uh, you people really are. And uh, um, and uh, I think uh, uh, the four of you are absolute leaders. And uh, and I hope that you show your leadership around people. Uh, I mean, uh, for the people around you. And uh, and I'm certain that uh, that uh, you know that uh, y'all will be responsible for making this world a better place. Thank you so much. And we hope that we, if we can even do half of what you have done for our world in terms of making it a better place, we'll be very, very um, happy. You already are. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ricky. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye. you. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Wow. How amazing was that, guys? We are all so privileged to have had an exclusive chat with Ricky Kedge. Yeah, it was amazing to get to speak to him and get to, he was such an amazing person to speak to and his wisdom that he was sharing about all this change and how he's trying to change the world. It's something that we should all, we should all take something out of that. Yeah. We should. And now we are really pleased to introduce our next guest, Dr. Arun Shah. Dr. Arun has been working with Wildlife SOS, an organization that makes lasting change to protect India's wildlife and biodiversity since 2004, which is actually before I was born. Hi, everyone. Dr. Dr. Arun currently operates out of the out of the Benagata Bear Rescue Center in Bangalore, India. As the Director of Research and Veterinary Operations, we are so honored to wel welcome you to our inaugural Switch on Global Telethon, Dr. Aaron. Thank you for joining us today. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Hi, everyone. As a part of your work with Wildlife SOS, your team works to rescue and re rehabilitate elephants. Can you please tell us a little bit about this process? Yep. Well, Wildlife SOS started the Ele Elephant Conservation Program in 2010 when the Wildlife SOS Elephant Conservation and Care Center was established in Mathura, Uttar Pradesh in India. Our rescue effort started with the safe rescue and rehabilitation of our first elephant, Champa, in the year 2009, who was a begging elephant in Uttar Pradesh. She would be seen walking gradually along the busy highway that connected Delhi to Agra in soaring temperature, torrential downpours, and spine-chilling winters. Champawa suffered from various ailments, ranging from injuries in his uh, foot and arthritic limbs and even chronic infections, which showed that she had suffered immense neglect in her past life. Her rescue treatment and psychological healing were made possible due to our dedicated team of vets that took special care of her needs in this important phase as she se settled in her new home. Nearly 11, seven years later, uh, Wildlife SOS has successfully rescued and rehabilitated over 40 elephants from situations of distress, exploitation and neglect. We presently have 32 elephants under our care who receives high quality care and treatment from our veterinary team. As you all know, the Asian elephants have been granted the highest protection by the law of the land, that is Wildlife Protection Act, which was enacted in 1972. The safe rescue and rehabilitation process involves proper coordination with the forest department they are the stakeholders of the wild animals, wild animals in the country, along with necessary paperwork that is important for the transfer of the elephant to the wildlife SOS facility for treatment and lifetime rehabilitation. Wildlife SOS also has a network of undercover informers who track blind, geriatric, injured and ill elephants in the country and tell us about their condition so that we are able to expedite their rescue in a timely manner. We heard that recently Wildlife SOS rescued an elephant called Nina. 
Could you tell us a bit about her rescue and tell us how she is now? Indeed, Wildlife Fisheries is presently in the middle of the rescue effort for a blind geriatric uh, female elephant uh, who is around 60 years old called uh, Nina. Nina has spent nearly six decades, which is 60 years of her life, walking on blazing tarmac roads and littered streets with no vision to guide her other than the brutal jab of a bullhook, which is really disgusting. To add to her discomfort, she would be covered with heavy adornments and used for wedding ceremonies. On top of it, she suffers from a fused joint in her hind limb, which is uh, otherwise technically known as ankylosis, owing to an untreated injury, which makes it very difficult for her to walk. She is actually uh, en route to our uh, rehabilitation center. Uh, probably in a couple of hours, uh, she will be uh, entering into her uh, rehabilitation center. And you can play an important role by contributing to her rescue so she may receive the treatment that she urgently deserves and by even signing the petition. Thank you. That's it's so amazing to hear what you've done to rescue and rehabilitate Nina. Now we are going to play a short video about Wildlife SOS Elephant Rehabilitation Program. Enjoy. We'll be right back after this to wrap up our chat. Fact about wild elephants. Their trunks are used for grazing, mud baths, and play. Gajraj was a temple elephant for 70 years. Forced to use his trunk to beg and salam. His weary trunk is a remnant of his long journey. Fact about wild elephants. Their ears are used to dissipate heat or to communicate pure joy. Chanchal was used in wedding processions for 16 years, forced to endure constant bull hooks to her ears. Her scars are a souvenir of her painful past. Fact about wild elephants. Their feet have shock absorbent padding, designed to walk soundlessly on earth. Asha was used for tourist rides at Amer Fort for 45 years. Forced to walk on concrete roads till her leg gave way. Her limp is a reminder of troubled times. Fact about wild elephants. Once captive, they can never be wild again. spikes and once I remove it uh, he's never gonna have to wear them again at wildlife SOS we believe with some help they can feel wild again Though they will not forget the traditional cruelty-based methods they were raised on. With some help, these methods can be replaced with humane forms of positive reinforcement. Though they will not forget the lifetime of scars and aching wounds. With some help, they can be routinely treated with the latest scientific equipment and medicine. Fact about our elephants. Though they can't be wild again, with some help, they can feel wild.
Wildlife SOS India. Their work is their work is so amazing. What did you guys think? Such an amazing and inspirational video. The work that you do. That's mind blowing. So amazing. So, Dr. Aaron, what can everyone do around the world to help protect elephants when they are such big creatures? Yeah, it's a very important uh, question that everyone can contribute to the nature and especially to help uh, elephants. We can take an oath that no one should engage an elephant to do riding on any elephant's back. So, uh, you know, to make an elephant rideable or controlled in captive condition, they are poached from the wild as ink calves. The moment they are poached from the wild, thus begins their breaking in process, which is also called fajan, which involves a brutal indoctrination process of starving and beating the calf into submission. The calves are kept in a contraption called crawl, which allows them no movement as their legs are tightly restrained on hard floors. For days, they are forced to stand in their own urine and dung, thus hugely affecting their health and the condition of their sensitive foot pads. These calves are not allowed to even sleep, rest, or even proper food and water to sustain themselves, making them extremely weak and vulnerable. This goes on for months until their spirit is completely broken and they are tamed to be controlled by humans to fuel their greed. Wildlife is Ways runs an active public awareness campaign called Refuse to Ride, wherein we urge tourists to understand the brutality behind elephants' rides. Every elephant that you witness on the street or in the circus or at temples has been subjected to similar brutality to allow rides. So I would definitely request the entire uh, uh, viewers that you can read more about this process on our website, refuse to ride.org and sign the petition to help the safe rehabilitation of blind, injured, geriatric and in ill captive elephants who have suffered immensely in their life. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Aaron. We, we had a really fantastic time talking with you about your work with the Wildlife SOS. And we hope that the audience li is listening to our integral switch on global telegram. Feel encouraged and excited to donate to this wonderful cause to protect Indian elephants. Check out our detail on your screen to donate to our hero of the hour, the Indian elephant. Ev Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Now we are super excited to introduce our next very special guest, Ian Redmond OBE. Ian has a very impressive list of qualifications. Not only is he the ambassador for the UN's Convention on Migratory Species, the chairman of the Eighth Alliance and the Gorilla Organization, he also co-founded an organization called Rebalance Earth. Hi, Ian. Thanks for joining us today. We are so excited to hear more about elephants worldwide. Good morning. Or good, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time of day it is where you are. Um, it is, uh, it's a delight to be back in India. Uh, because last year I spent January in Kerala and February in Gujarat. Uh, and that was because India was hosting the Conference of the Parties of the UN Convention on Migratory Species. And at that conference, the Asian elephant was listed uh, under the convention, which means it, it uh, enables neighboring countries who share elephant habitat. And of course, elephants don't ob obey human constructed borders. They move back and forth. So it's clear that conservation has to be transboundary, just as the elephants and other species listed under the convention uh, are, are, because it's our shared responsibility 
to look after the elephants. I, I so wanted to join in with the discussion with Ricky Cage. I really loved his music, uh, but he spoke such such important things uh, about our personal responsibility for helping elephants uh, and other species. Uh, and I want to tell you a little bit about Rebalance Earth because it has to do with elephants. But I don't know if you have specific questions you want to ask me or do you just want me to tell you all about it? Okay. We, do, we do have some specific questions to ask you first. And then if we have time, we'd love to hear a lot more about Rebalance Earth. Okay. Elephants are a keystone species in their habitats, forests, and savanna woodlands across 51 countries, 38 in Africa, and 13 in Asia. But their numbers have declined dramatically. Why are elephants such an important species? Well, they're important for all sorts of reasons. I mean, if, if philosophically, that they are beings. We're human beings, they're elephant beings. Each elephant has a brain nearly four times the size of mine or yours. So they're really intelligent animals. They probably think deep thoughts. They have a complex multi-level society. And when we kidnap them and force them to work in chains, or when we kill them and cut off their front teeth and make nice little ornaments out of them, we are clearly disrespecting that, that other being, that non-human being. But ecologically, they're so important because they have a huge appetite. Obviously, elephants might be, might weigh four or five tons, or even in, in the case of big African elephants, six or seven tons. And that takes a lot of food. And they eat only plants, and they eat leaves and, and bark and fruit. And when an elephant eats fruit, it usually eats the whole fruit. And so the seeds inside the fruit go into the elephant's stomach. Now, this is a case of co-evolution over millions of years, that plants have evolved seeds that have a tough outer protective layer so that they can survive the passage through a gut. And that outer layer means that if a, if a fruit just falls off a tree and lands on the earth, it's unlikely to germinate. It needs to be chewed and digested and then arrive on the ground in a package of fertilizer because elephants produce a lot of dung. Each elephant is going to produce every week about one metric ton of first-class organic manure or dung. And if they've been feeding on fruit, that manure is full of seeds. So when you find elephant dung a couple of weeks after the elephant dropped it, it's bursting with seeds. It looks like a gardener's seed bed. Most of those seeds are not going to reach maturity, but many of them will. And those are the trees of tomorrow. So you were hearing how we're trying to balance our, our um our carbon budget. Each of us have to think, well, what is our carbon footprint? How do we reduce it? If we can't reduce it by changing the technology, the car we drive or, or the, the things we buy, then we depend upon companies and, and each other as individuals to balance our carbon budget by offsetting. And that is where Rebalance Earth comes in. I mean, the, the elephants I studied in, in, in Kenya uh, are extraordinary. They go deep in, into caves. And people are so fascinated by elephants that uh, they go into caves to mine the rock because the rock is rich in minerals and elephants, like other animals, need to visit a salt lick if they are salt hungry. So th there are all these aspects of their behavior, that their ecology, uh, that their society, which fascinate us. And because they're so strange to look at compared to human anatomy, you know, that long nose and upper lip combined to create basically like a fifth limb like they use their the tip of their trunk like we use our finger and, and thumb to very carefully pick up small objects so they are fascinating and extraordinary and, and, and they fill us with wonder so they are wonderful and we tend to forget that they actually have a job to do and the job they do is to act as, as gardeners of the forest hashtag gardeners of the forest and you'll find lots of articles and videos about elephant ecology and one of the most disturbing things about elephants is that we don't value them in their natural habitat we don't value the work that they do every day of their lives by eating and producing manure by dispersing seeds but it turns out that work does have a value particularly in today's world where we've suddenly created a market for carbon so if you want to offset your carbon emissions wouldn't it be wonderful if you could basically pay elephants that would be very cool 
that is that is what rebalance earth is doing first of all with elephants but then with other keystone species um the, the word keystone in in terms of ecology is important if you think of a, a stone arch when when if you look at a, a, an old building a church or, or a a temple very often the, the stone arches are, are a series of blocks of stone stacked up and then there's a big stone in the middle at the top which is the keystone and when you build an arch you have to build a wooden structure and you stack the stones on you put the keystone in then you can take the wooden structure away because it stands up on its own so a keystone species like that keystone in the arch if you take it away the whole thing collapses so you remove elephants from an ecosystem in which they've evolved to play a part and that ecosystem will, will collapse. Many species depend on elephants, and we are one of those species, but we have failed to recognize that. So with yeah. rebalanced earth, we're, we're building on some research done by an Italian biologist in the Congo Basin in Africa. And he looked at two forests, one where there are elephants, and one where the elephants were killed for their ivory decades ago. And what he found, and this is an important thing, and we have to look at how this applies across Asia as well as in Africa. What he found was that where there are elephants, there is about 7% more carbon stored in the trees than where there are no elephants. It turns out that elephants, as they eat vegetation, as they trample on small plants, they are basically doing the job of a gardener, thinning out the plants. And then the big trees, which store the most carbon, get bigger because they have less competition from little plants and the elephants eat the vegetation and produce dung, which is fertilizer. So when you are growing vegetables and you pull out what you call the weeds, the wild flowers that have seeds have blown into your garden, you want to reduce the competition so you get bigger vegetables. And then you compost those weeds on a compost heap and put those nutrients back on the, on the soil to grow bigger vegetables. And that's what elephants are doing when they feed in a forest. So I'd love to work with Dr. Aaron and somehow find a way to put the elephants that he's rescued into forest not perhaps just let them go, but to let them feed naturally so that they can be elephants and play that job in the forest. So we have forests with no elephants. They don't store as much carbon. We have elephants with no forests. They have a rotten life in chains or, or in a rescue center. Let's put the two together. And because there is a carbon market, people who want to offset their carbon can pay for that. Wouldn't that be amazing? Because if you're paying for um, carbon markets, uh, if, if you're paying for carbon offset and at the same time you're protecting elephants, then the farmers who, who have a problem with elephants coming into their fields would have the money to put up a proper fence. And if an elephant ate their crops and they took a picture of the elephant, if it's one of our client elephants, then they would get paid since the last time that elephant was identified. So we have to work on identifying individual elephants and we have to give the local communities who share their land or live alongside elephant habitat the money that is the carbon offset brings in so that they can live a better life and protect their crops and their families from the elephants and the elephants can live a better life obviously in in a way that doesn't block their migratory routes you can't put fences up when elephants are trying to migrate that's why it's important to cross borders also not to put fences up but to let the elephants go to enhance the carbon storage of the forests in which they they feed and then we all benefit that's what we're trying to do with rebalance earth that's so amazing. Um, I had no idea how important elephants are for the ecosystem. Um, just before we finish, really, really quickly, um, Isla, I think Isla has one more question for you. Okay. You carried out the first study and photo photography at, of underground elephants in caves of Mount Elgon in Kenya. Could you please tell us a little bit about the experience? <laughs> How long have you got? Yes, um, the idea of elephants in caves is surprising to most people. And this, this behavior of, of digging into earth or, or cliffs, if they have minerals in them that the elephants like the taste of because it, it meets their dietary needs, has in various parts of the world, elephants have created overhangs uh, if, if there's a cliff with a mineral rich layer, they will dig into it. But after a while, the, the, the overhang collapses. So over hundreds and thousands of years, you have a slowly receding cliff because of the elephants tusking, using their tusks uh, or their trunks, their toenails 
to uh, loosen the rock and eat it. On Mount Elgin, the layer of mineral rich rock is capped by a flow of lava, which is very tough and waterproof. So when the rain falls on the, the, the mountain, it runs off the lava, under the lava flow, there are still soluble salts. And it's the sodium ions. We, we, we usually use sodium chloride. These particular salts are sodium sulfate, but it's the sodium ions that the elephants need. And by eating that rock and sucking it and swallowing it, and literally they, they take it out in their gut. So the cave's getting bigger and bigger every year as elephants go in. Uh, instead of a receding cliff, you get a bigger and bigger cave because the lava layer is, is strong enough to hold up the roof. So that's how those caves developed. And if you want to find out more about them, there's a website called Vicotourism, V for virtual, ecotourism.org. If you go to Vicotourism and click on take a tour, you can take a virtual tour into the caves and look around. You'll see little hot spots. Click on the hot spot and you'll get a little uh, video uh, and you can learn about this amazing phenomenon. Uh, so, so yes, um, really cool. it, it, yeah. it is one of the most extraordinary experiences. You know, elephants speak to each other using infrasound sound that's oh, too wow. low for the human ear to hear but it travels for miles so they literally make long distance trunk calls to each other using infrasonic communications and those big padded feet that you saw in the, the film a few minutes ago those are sensitive to seismic vibrations so when an elephant rumbles it doesn't just come through the air it comes through the ground and they're feeling with their feet wow. these long distance communications now think about that rumbling inside a cave so the whole air is vibrating and you can feel it with your body as much as your ears. It's very exciting. That sounds so amazing. And thank you so much for joining us, Ian. We have really enjoyed hearing about the elephant and your passion for your work is so inspiring to see. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye. Thank you for uh, hosting me. So, our Indian chapter is now coming to an end, and it's time to hand over to our African chapter team, Nathaniel and Shehan. We would like to thank all of our wonderful Indian chapter guests, Grammy Award winning composer Ricky Kedge and Dr. Arun Shah from India, and Ian Redmond OBE from the UK. Remember, you can donate to the Indian Elephant via the links on your screen. And Ian, we are very pleased to say that you are now zooming on over to join our team in Africa, wearing a different hat as chairman of the Ape Alliance to speak about the hero of the next hour, the chimpanzee. See you there. <laughs>